My name is Pamela Van Helsema. I'm the director of community and digital programs for, thank you, Kyle, for After the Fire. And I'm a fire survivor. Five years ago, on October 9, my house burned down. And I wasn't the only one. Thousands of houses here in Sonoma County burned on that day. My neighborhood was gone, and all I had were questions. But I knew I wasn't the only one. I knew that my neighbors had questions, the leaders in our community had questions, and we needed to get in touch with one another so we could work together toward this. The theme of this panel this morning, and you'll meet some incredible leaders right here from different places and in different um, aspects of recovery, have done that magical work of organizing their community so that they can move forward and reach those new milestones. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and allow them to each introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their work in community organizing. And then we'll have a discussion after you get to know them a little bit and we'll take a look at, um, I should go to the next slide. We'll take a look at the work that they do and, and if they have some common um, advice to share and concerns and ideas and resources. Is that good? So first I'd like to introduce my neighbor and friend, Jeff Okrepke. Jeff. Oh, these are stuck on there. All right, uh, good, yeah, still good morning. Um, my name's Jeff Okrepke. Uh, I am Pam's neighbor about three blocks away. Um, October 8th, is when the Tubbs fire started. It didn't reach our neighborhood until October 9th. Uh, and about 1.30 in the morning, me, my um, new bride of four months, and our, uh, at the time, two-year-old son uh, evacuated from Coffee Park in Santa Rosa and um, found out a couple hours later our house and our entire neighborhood were gone. Uh, about 1,350 homes in Coffee Park specifically burned and about 5,000 buildings uh, in all of Sonoma County burned for the Tubbs fire. That doesn't include the Nuns fire, which is on this side of the valley, or the Atlas fire, which was in Napa at the same time, um, or the Pocket fire. Uh, those were all happening on the same night. So um, it's funny, I was talking to somebody earlier and uh, they were like, oh, this LTRG and this LTRG, and I go, excuse me, what's an LTRG? And they go, oh, it's a long-term recovery group. And I was like, cool, that would've been awesome five years ago. Um, we didn't have anything like that. And so um, what ended up happening was in my personal life, I, I work as a commercial insurance agent. I insure businesses and I deal a lot with contractors. Um, my father was an elected official at the time and I had personal friendships with some um, elected officials in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. And I wanted to do some good. I, I, I was evacuated, uh, me, my wife, who we found out was pregnant three days after the fire. Um, our son and our two dogs were living in a guest room at my parents' house and um, kind of despondent and had no idea what we were going to do and just trying to figure out like what's going to happen that day, let alone in the future. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to do some good. I'm going to put together a panel discussion much like this with some builders, some city officials, some elected officials, and basically tell everybody like, this is how you build a house. Because Coffee Park was a subdivision, none of those were custom homes. None of, I'm not gonna say none, but 99.99% of the people that lost their homes had never even built a home or knew it went into building a home. And so we wanted to educate them on the pro, I wanted to, you know, like, hey, here's what to expect. So we had this, uh, this panel discussion. I thought, that was great, we did some real good. And then I started getting messages about like, hey, when's the next one, when's the next one, when's the next one? And I was like, I didn't plan on there being a next one. So um, I started gathering uh, contact information, uh, doing it all by hand, and that's how I met Pam. She was like, hey, why don't you use a Google form instead of just filling out an Excel spreadsheet every single time? And I was like, that's a great idea. And um, started connecting with some other people, and we had another discussion, and we had heard, uh, or another meeting, and we had heard about this block captain system um, and decided to adopt it. And basically what we ended up doing was having a 250 person meeting at a, a concert hall basically called the Luther Burbank Center. And we basically got a giant map 
of the fire affected area of Coffee Park and arbitrarily with markers laid on the stage like this one and just drew lines down streets because we had no idea what we were doing at the time and just said, all right, if you live on this street and this street or north of that, go to that part of the building. If you live on this area, go to that part of the building. We, we, we basically divided up Coffee Park in five areas and started gathering contact information and said, hey, if you want to be a leader in this rebuild, raise your hand. And a bunch of people did. And we had a meeting of the leadership group with probably about 35, 40 people that showed up the first time. And over the next two years, that dwindled down to a core group of maybe 15 people or so. And we um, developed this organization, Coffee Strong. Uh, that heart right there, that's Coffee Park. Uh, all those red dots are homes that burned. Um, and we incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. We started raising money and we helped our, um, our community rebuild really, really fast. And at, to this day, I believe we're 98 to 99% rebuilt um, of the 1,350 homes that burned. <laughs> so, um, and I don't know, is that, is- That's a good intro. That's a good intro, that's all right, intro. great. Okay. And so, get to know our next, whoops, get to know Nancy Presser. Nancy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Presser. I am from Plumas County, a resident of Greenville. My home was burnt. Um, my business was burnt. So after the fire, for me, it was a decision. Do you come back or do you... <laughs> Or do you um, move on? And it was super easy for me to say as a business owner that lost everything and a community member of 11 years, hey, I'll just move on. I'll start over. I'll go live with my mom. I'll go somewhere else. I'll go somewhere there where there's economic development, where there's things already in place, where there's technology, where, you know, where life would be easier. But in that evacuation process, it was very apparent that my family was not on board <laughs> with Nancy's vision. So um, we moved back up here. We had an opportunity to rent in Lassen County, which is super close to Plumas County. And it was like all the doors that were closing in my face um, where I thought I wanted to relocate just started to open. And um, we found a place that we could rent in Lassen County. We found a home that we could purchase in Lassen County. Um, we had support coming out of um, unknown wells of just funding, but love and support from so many different community members. And so it was like, my family and I were able to thrive. So instead of choosing to rebuild a business that had burnt down, I chose to find a position that could use the skills I've been honing for over 20 years as a massage therapist and movement specialist, um, where I could give that care and compassion back to my community. So um, an opportunity came up. I was actually just going into our uh, Alliance for Workforce Development to fill out paperwork for disaster, uh, what is it? Unemployment, right? <laughs> and they said to me, what are you doing? I go, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. And they're like, you should apply for this job. And that's how I got here. That's how I got into the disaster world. Um, it's been a journey. Um, we were fortunate to get financial funding for a disaster case management program prior to FEMA coming in. So it's possible if you guys are looking at that. And um, so I was three months after my home burnt down, I was working with people and getting to know my community in ways I'd never thought I would know. I would get to know my community, work with people, amazing people in my community. And um, yeah, I think that's enough for an introduction. <laughs> Tucker, I have a minute. 
Okay. All right. Um, my name. Yeah, my name is Tucker Teutsch, um, and the organization I run is called Firebrand Resiliency Collective. Um, we have a couple programs that are our primary. One is the Almeda Fire Zone Captains Program, and the other is the Loss and Recovery Project. Um, I didn't lose my home in the fire. Um, I like to say I evacuated three times that day. Uh, first, I got my folks out of Ashland, and then went back to my hometown of Talent to pack up. Um, and you know, we, we found each other that night, and uh, um, we just kind of settled into bed when we got the level two get set um, to prepare to evacuate yet again. We didn't have to, but I, I still do count that like, you know, emotional work of watching the Alameda fire sweep through and wipe out half my hometown and then Phoenix um, partly and, and uh, as, as sort of the third evacuation of that day. But um, the next day, I came back into town. Um, and um, there were a lot of good organizations on the ground, some of them in this room, doing some really important response work, um, providing relief to, to our survivors. And um, I, I really wanted to work on the long, long-term recovery of the valley. Um, and about a month after our fire, uh, Rebuild North Bay, Jennifer, and I think Doug at the time, um, came up and um, we held a community meeting with a number of um, uh, organizations that were, and individuals really at that point, some of us didn't even have organizations, we were just interested and wanted to help, um, to talk about some of, the, some of the, the programs that had worked in other areas. So one of the things that really stuck with me was this idea of Coffee Strong and the block captain system and the idea of Paradise and their zone captain system. And so um, it wasn't, you know, there were a lot of things that were broken open and revealed and they were broken kind of all the way down and we realized we needed to start with sort of the that community first approach um, in order to work towards long-term recovery. So uh, a bunch of us, similar to his story, uh, we sat around and we started looking at our fire burn scar and it burned across um, three towns and through unincorporated Jackson County. So we decided to, you know, that's, that's a lot more than, you know, like one neighborhood and, like, and, 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 and uh, five sort of areas of that. We started breaking up our fire map by development type. So you had agricultural land, you had single family homes, you had 21 manufactured housing parks that were wiped out in that fire. You had commercial zone districts. Um, and then you get into sort of demographic things like 55 and older communities, all that kind of stuff. So we identified 29 different zones for the Alameda fire and I had a random five minute conversation uh, with our local work source uh, agency uh, and they said, hey, do you ha we have these dislocated worker grants, do you have anything? And I was like, well, we have these 21 zones and each one of them needs a captain. And nothing came of that for about a month and all of a sudden they called me back and said, hey, we funded all 21 jobs, do you have these people in place? Uh, and we did not. Um, and we never got representation in every one of those zones, but what we did um, do was take to heart this idea of emergent community leadership and rather than um, rely on volunteers from the fire affected community coming together we were able to give them employment for the long term um, and so we have uh, worked with the community members in a number of those zones um, and recruited them into employment and then also put the word out, started hosting weekly social support circles amongst survivors, um, whether you were a business was one, whether you were a, a manufactured home um, resident, whether you were maybe a stick-built homeowner. We had different social support nurkle, uh, circles. And so these folks would come up into these places and realize, hey, I actually want to put my hand in the air and, and help my neighborhood na neighbors um, recover. Because they, they have, may have understood those resources a little bit better, been able to navigate them, and those programs are always really hard. Um, and so we're able to employ those folks. But because we'd created that map, we now had the basis to start analyzing um, how the neighborhoods were recovering and at what rate. So uh, we started our other program, which is the Loss and Recovery Project, and it was called, the, you can see the picture of the recovery dashboard, to go neighborhood by neighborhood and look at which neighborhoods were pulling permits to rebuild, which ones were slower to come back, and really break down that analysis at the neighborhood level and say, hey, and identify those resource gaps. And so um, if we saw a neighborhood coming back strong, up here would be like the Barnum neighborhood in Phoenix. You know, it's like 69% at this point, come back after two years, which is amazing. 
or we saw a manufactured housing park, which was just really slow to come back because of supply chain issues, because of you know, uh, Ray, the increased cost two to three times conservatively of what people lost. Um, we're able to have those discussions with the relationships we've built at the higher government levels of like, hey, there's a resource gap here. Can we steer programs toward these neighborhoods or can we, st can we make sure the information is, is uh, you know, available to the folks? Um, so we did the geographical thing and now we started doing some data stelling, data driven storytelling about some of the individual neighborhoods and, and their resilience or their, you know, the barriers, they were specific barriers to those neighborhoods. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have to say a whole lot more about that, but certainly um, I, I feel like the, 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 the program of the block or zone captains or really just community liaisons in general are a very fundamental building block for both long term, short term and long term recovery, but also that resilience creation, that readiness place. Um, and how can we take that local community emergent leadership and, and, and leave that in place for the long term because that's going to create more connective tissue, it's going to create more authenticity in some of our, in some of our governance in some ways. Um, and um, it's really nice to be able to vet those, the things that are coming down the pipeline through that lens of survivor-led work uh, and, you know, just make sure that we kind of emerge from it as, as a more resilient, more connective tissue community. Thank you. Um, Anne, I'd like to have you introduce your work now. Thank you. Anne Watley. All right. I'm from Ventura County, and so we're kind of between L.A. and Santa Barbara. And we had fires in 2017, the Thomas Fire, uh, about six weeks after the fires up here. And then about 11 months later, the Woolsey and Hill Fires uh, in 2018. And uh, I, I was uh, in the evacuation zone, but thankfully did not lose my home, but many of my friends and neighbors did. So we had about 12 or 1300 structures that were lost in the first fire and about 1600 in the second. Um, and so uh, I guess a little, and, and ours in, uh, affected kind of different areas, as, as Tucker was just saying. We had uh, about six or 700 homes in the city of Ventura in several different neighborhoods, some apartment buildings, and then also in uh, more rural agricultural areas that lost farm worker housing and some other kind of unincorporated areas. So we were dealing with very different populations and, and rebuilding scenarios. Uh, and so um, I guess a little more context for, uh, the, I'm a social scientist. The work I do is really uh, uh, assessing social change and spe specifically around uh, collective uh, and collaborative efforts. And so most of the work that I have been doing professionally over the last 10 or 15 years is more at the national level. Uh, and but then when this happened in my neighborhood in my community I was like okay this is like made for me I should do this uh, and I stepped in and started in the very first days after the fire and I was like what is going on this is like insanity no one no one's talking to each other no one knows what anyone else is doing uh, and so I started uh, the work of kind of trying to like have conversation after conversation. I kept thinking there was going to be somebody else who could like step in and continue this work and I could advise and that never happened. <laughs> so I'm here five years later. Uh, I facilitate the long-term disaster recovery group um, and so uh, I try to just keep the conversations going and bringing all the different pieces together uh, and I'm I guess I think that's enough for an introduction. Thanks. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce you to Laura Wheeler. Laura, can you tell us about the work that you are engaged in, in up in Greenville, Plumas County? Sure. Sure. Yep. Testing. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Laura Wheeler. Uh, I applied knowledge that I learned over 18 years working for a world bleeding oil spill response and prevention program to respond to the Dixie Fire. 
Uh, with the help of hundreds of volunteers and donors, I founded the Rebuilding Greenville Resource Center. I could go on for hours about the experience, so I wrote a shortened down account of it. When the mandatory evacuation order went into effect, I was caretaking my mother's home while she was out of state. I began volunteering at the Crescent Mills Fire Department and I looked for spot fires, provided structure protection, and provided information about local water resources to the wildland fire crews that were coming into the area. On August 4th, 2021, the Dixie Fire blew into Greenville at 60 miles per hour and burned 78% of the structures, including my mother's home, Nancy's home and business, uh, many friends' homes and businesses. It also took the entire community of Canyon Dam, half of Indian Falls, and deeply impacted Warner Valley. It was the second largest wildfire in California history. The fire came within a quarter mile of Crescent Mills, where I had evacuated to the night after it took Greenville. Uh, amazingly, the town was standing the next morning. I think everyone in town was surprised to see that. In Crescent Mills, the fire trucks had drained the water tower and it was filled with pond water that couldn't be consumed. The electricity had been out for weeks. Volunteers were out of food. The pets and livestock that were left behind were out of food. Both gas stations had burned, so there was no gas for generators. The situation was bleak and I knew I could focus on the devastation and loss or I could use what training and skills I had learned in uh, disaster response for oil spills in Alaska to try to improve the situation. The owners of the Crescent Mill tow shop formed a donor group and I provided them with a list of resources that we needed in Crescent Mills. They contacted the sheriff's office and got a pass to bring the delivery through the roadblock. Uh, the photo above on the screen shows part of this delivery displayed on a friend's porch where I had evacuated to. I created a Facebook page to advertise available resources and they were distributed quickly. Donors saw the ad and began contacting me to request lists of needs. I saw a propensity for this to really grow, so I secured a commercial building on Highway 89 to put the donations coming in. I contacted 15 friends and asked them to help volunteer, and every single one of them stepped up. When residents came back in, everyone had been impacted financially, and hundreds were without housing. Donors supplied them with tents, lanterns, air mattresses, bedding, pots and pans, diapers, gas cards, and medical supplies. Carhartt sent clothing, PetSmart and Chewy donated pet food. We received grants for all forms of heating assistance. We put in a computer lab so fire survivors could file insurance claims, file for FEMA, and other types of public assistance. Volunteer Penny Robbins had experience working with Plumas County Social Services. She became the go-to person for homeless people in need of housing. People would show up at the resource center with garbage sacks full of belongings and she'd get them a key to a FEMA trailer by the end of the day. Over 150 volunteers pitched in, including AmeriCorps and the Girl Scouts in the picture up above. Because of their collaboration, the Resource Center was able to expand. I provided updates to the Dixie Fire Collaborative members, such as Cal OES, FEMA, and nonprofit organizations wanting to plug in. This network proved to be a tremendous support that offered mentorship, information, and resources. In these meetings, representatives from California Office of Emergency Services and FEMA called the community organizing for the Dixie Fire the quickest they had ever seen. A Plumas County government leader announced that the speed of the fire recovery is being recognized at the federal level. So the Rebuilding Greenville Resource Center became the hub for people impacted by the Dixie Fire. In order to collect funding offered for long-term operating costs and for administrative support, we went under the umbrella of a social services nonprofit called Plumas Rural Services. 
The groundwork the donors, the volunteers, and I laid to create a hub for the Dixie Fire Recovery enabled us to provide hundreds of referrals of clients to PRS's Disaster Case Management Program. We were thanked by Nancy Presser for the referrals that were instrumental in helping the DCM program be awarded a FEMA contract. In addition to managing Greenville Resource, rebuilding Greenville Resource Center, PRS asked if I would oversee the disaster case management program. I wanted to gravitate towards working in economic development, so I took on an offer to work as executive director at Indian Valley Innovation Hub. This month, I started helping small business owners to develop, market, and distribute products for export. We're on a mission to bring outside dollars into the Dixie Fire area in order to reestablish our economy. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, clearly you see by this panel how these folks mobilized, didn't wait for someone to ask them to do it, but saw a need and brought their own skills, resources, and abilities to meet that need right in front of them. And I'm kind of curious to ask each of you, and you can respond uh, as, you, as, as you think of an answer to this. How do you, as a community leader, first of all, find the value of being from there? being the one who is the, right, right there at the time of disaster, these are, this is your community, as a, being a leader, and then how do you earn the trust of those people who have just lost everything and been through this? And where is trust an important part of community organizing? All right, um, so uh, I mean the value of it is just knowing what's going on, right? It's the boots on the ground, front line, knowing the issues. Um, and um, that way you're not filtering anything through a third party playing the telephone game with whomever you're trying to work with. Um, in terms of earning trust, that was, a, that was something I think that we at Coffee Strong were very cognizant of from the beginning. And then more so once we uh, incorporated as a nonprofit because then we knew we would have money, right? And people would be like, oh, okay, so what are you doing with that money? And we were very, very transparent in what we were trying to accomplish and what we were trying to do and where that money was going from our fundraisers and the grants that we received. Um, and I, it's kind of one of those, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You, if you put in the work and you do the right thing and you give that selfless and um, um, greater community uh, uh, effort, then people are going to see like, oh, this, they're not in this for selfish reasons. You know, we, you know, people always ask me, it's like, how did you create this nonprofit? Like, who are these leaders? And I'm like, oh, our leaders? Yeah, um, an insurance salesman, a librarian, an electrician, a, uh, a guy, the one that I love to point out is a guy who is the number one world authority on stage sword fights. Um, <laughs> That's true. Like he go, he's traveled the U.S. and the world to like teach people how to do a sword fight for Macbeth. And these are the people that started our our nonprofit and put this work in. So we're not trying to gain anything. We're not, you know, most of us still have our same jobs or similar jobs, and we're not trying to gain anything for ourselves. We're just trying to rebuild our community. And so I think when you do something like that, and you have just average everyday people, you gain the trust of the community you're trying to serve. I, I would second all that, and also I would uh, I would say it's listening and then then responding quickly. I mean, I think some of it is on some small asks to like establish the the that that you are going to do something, and and then building from there, uh, and and so it's it's a, a long process. I think transparency is huge, and keeping everyone kind of up to speed on it and, and then just sticking around and continuing to say that. Because I think uh, you're gonna have people who aren't interested for a year or two and then will come around and wanna talk to you in year three, year four. And so just keep that line of communication open. Um, and then there'll be people who circle back and, uh, and that's all you can do, I think. Um, I think from a disaster case management standpoint, it really helped that I was a community member. And, um, and so 
it, they hired somebody who had been in the community and who could coordinate the community and also do the hiring um, of the other case managers. But more than that, I see that it's um, listening. It's, I guess, one of the first things that somebody said to me who was a disaster case manager said, don't give out hope. And I was like, what? I was like, what do you mean? Don't give out. She goes, don't ever promise anything. Don't give out hope. And that, as a compassionate person, was just like breaking, tearing my heart apart. But what I found is that it's, it's not making promises that helps create trust, but being in, putting yourself in their shoes when you're talking to them. Like, how would it feel? I mean, there's so many stories out there that I've heard that are so different than mine, that are so much more tragic than mine. And um, it's being able to listen, but put myself in their shoes and then give them maybe that I'm gonna be there with you. My hand is in your hand. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what I can get you. I hear your story, I see that you have this amazing need, so I'm just gonna be that person that's walking this with you. And when you walk that fire, when you're walking with them by, side by side, it's like it opens up this ability for them to find those resources themselves. That they, you, you might not do anything but just listen and brainstorm and, and give them that spark that this is possible. And then I've seen people do amazing things when there's nothing that I can do. And then follow up. Yeah. To build trust, it's follow up. <laughs> you know, let them know that they're not alone, you know, that you're not leaving them, that you're, um, you're, you're always gonna be by their, their side, you know, even when it's hard, because doing this on a daily basis with people and hearing people's stories on a daily basis and, and the devastation and the negativity and the hopelessness on a daily basis, it's hard to show up sometimes. So you've got to do your self-care, you do your due diligence, but then go back and say, we're in this together. We're going to do this together. You know, being born and, and, and mostly raised in, in talent, my hometown is, is super critical that that local because uh, we drew the fire you know map from memory essentially trying to retrace what neighborhoods were there and what type of neighborhoods they were and get some survivors in a room and figure out what was your neighborhood like and all that kind of thing um, so that local that local place-based knowledge is very very critical um, I'd also say that you know as far as um, as trust goes I think giving out good information you know, um, basically making sure that the information that you're communicating to survivors uh, is just absolutely essential that it that it's that it's not um, correct. And I mean, of course, you know, we it's it's the fog of recovery or the fog of war in a lot of ways, and it can be really hard to make sense of what's out there. You know, if uh, if a, if an agency uh, gives you what we like to call exploding PDFs of eight page of government jargon, what is the usable information? What is the action item that we can give to survivors? Is it translated? Uh, you know, what, making sure that the information you're putting out there is is good information and that those are high value resources um, can build trust because then people know they can go to you and you, you're not going to lead them down a, a dead end. Um, it's not spreadsheets of spreadsheets of here's the resource list. It's the ones that have been vetted by survivors and here's the ones you can have, set, have, have success with. Um, and then as well, I, I really love that. Just show up and keep showing up. That constant interaction is important. That's one of the reasons why when we did the social support groups, they didn't happen I mean, they happened every single week with, you know, if, oh, this person's sick, they're down with COVID, then find someone else to come in and mediate that and, 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 help, and help lead those. And those are places where survivors, and um, sometimes we'd have an agency guest come in and speak specifically about their thing, but they knew that they could come and they could workshop with their solutions together. And it's laying the table for that trust. It's not necessarily trying to grab it, um, because it's more important that survivors rely on each other than that they you know, trust me individually, that they can trust each other to keep showing up for one another. So I think that's, that's important. And then to your you know, point about sort of the, the, the trust and the relationships with like funders, um, it, you know, we went from, uh, 
forming a nonprofit and you know kind of you know putting the bucket under the under the spigot uh, to government grants um, to fund folks and there's a huge reporting piece in there and that that when you can report on your your metrics of success over and over and over again and refine based on those things then you can create that trust um, between philanthropy the work you do government and the work you do and then also making sure that the, that trust within your survivor network is in place I think the things that created trust uh, at the Resource Center were our transparency with the funding. Um, tracking on funding and donations really built the trust in the community and with our funders. Um, having a professional financial management uh, administrator was huge. Um, we didn't have the time to do that, so that was my number one reason for needing to go under uh, a nonprofit organization was that administrative support. Um, the checks and balances on funding was huge. Um, not taking a high paying job. Uh, I took something that was uh, about a quarter of what I was making before the disaster. Um, it was helpful to not offer guarantees to people, uh, but at the same time to really show that we cared and to be genuine with people, uh, don't shine them on, um, and to be very present with them, to, to be there, to be open as often as possible, and just being present was huge in developing trust. I wanted to chime in also, building on this idea of trust and, and vetted information. Um, that's something that we also did in Coffee Park, is um, people, we invited questions um, through our block captain system of what are the challenges and questions you have today, and then as block captains we met with whoever those officials were um, that may be able to help us find the answers. And a lot of times, um, they didn't know what the answer was yet. Um, and sometimes the answer changed. And so what I wanted to say was, when we communicated to our community, said, here's what the answer is now, and know that the answer might change. Because one way of breaking down trust is giving them some information, and two months later, the information is different. And both of them were right at the moment that they were communicated. And we like, made sure we put a date on that said, as of right now, this is what we think the answer is. And then in two months, oh, you know, because our city leaders, our planning office, our, our county and uh, city elected officials were doing this the best they could. They've never faced this thing before. And so they were able to be actually vulnerable and, and and sit down at the table and say, we gotta figure it out. And um, sometimes the answer changed later. But for us to be able to enter that, and you know, we all have to make big decisions when we're trying to rebuild our, our homes and our businesses and, and make these choices, to realize that we're all trying to figure out, and our, our county supervisor, James Gore, always used the term, imperfect, relentless imperfect progress. It's not gonna be perfect. And, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do our best anyway. One last question, we have about five more minutes. Let's get down to some really practical stuff. What were maybe some tools or strategies that you're like, yes, that actually worked really well, that you might be able to share with others here? Maybe it was a, a, you know, a kind of technology, or maybe it was some kind of strategy for finding the people. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to find everybody after their house is burned down and they left town. You gotta track them down. Do you have any nuggets of wisdom or practical tips that you can share with others in the room about how to organize after wildfire? I'll give a little example. From our community, um, one of the first things that um, one of our community members did was start a database because none of the other uh, organizations, government organizations, were sharing information. So she sat working 12 hours a day for seven weeks, going through properties and finding out who it was and creating this database. 
because she had, her name is Sue Weber, she's our long-term recovery, our Dixie Fire Collaborative um, co-chair. But because she started it, because somebody told her, you gotta start going to these meetings, it's because she started that as a disaster case management program that came in three months under three months after the fire, way before FEMA funding came in, we had access to the database that she started creating so we could contact people. The other thing that was valuable for us was Laura's position, her Rebuilding Greenville Resource Center. We wouldn't have had access to people who were coming in for resources that were hurting without us going out and being part of that as well and showing up and meeting people. It's easy sometimes when you're hired for a job not to get involved, like to sit in an office or sit in front of your computer all day. But with wildfire, you've got to put, you got to put your, you got to be, you got to show up, you know, you just have to show up. And because of that, now we're having more and more resource events. We're actually going out to the smaller communities that burn so they know. We've got, been to Canyon Dam. We're planning to go to Indian Falls, Warner Valley, Westwood, where our FEMA trailers are, which is in a whole different county, 2,000 feet higher in elevation. And these folks were housed in trailers in the winter under six or more feet of snow. So you got to do those things that that tell people that you know they're cared about and um, use the resources that you have in your community and um, yeah, make liaisons with them. Well, specific tools. Um, yeah, so like I said, part of our stuff was sort of geospatially organized, so we really quickly got involved with Esri, um, the makers of ArcGIS. Um, we became a sponsored nonprofit pretty quick. And in fact, one of the talent re ex talent residents worked for Esri, so we started working directly with them. Um, we were able to go down a couple months ago to the Esri user conference and present on, because the thing is, what you have as a baseline, almost every county, FEMA, others, will make a loss. Uh, dashboard or damage assessment dashboard, right? Now uses tax lot data and, 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 and geospatial information to show loss. What we wanted to do was show the recovery over time. And so that's a really interesting um, bit of technology that we've been able to use it. And there's, there's almost, there's, there's a usually an environmental sciences uh, program at every, you know, university. You can, we did recruited kids right out of there to start being a, coming our GIS team. Um, but as well, once you create sort of that, that map bit, if you can, then you have to figure out, well, how do you take in public input, right? And so uh, I'd first heard about Social Pinpoint from uh, Pamela, who I know is a big map geek like me. Um, but also um, there's, other, there's other programs called Hello Lamp Post. There's other, there's other ways to make things real because you can't just live in a digital world. You have to create an analog version of everything you do digitally, right? You have to have surveying in the field. You have to have Google Forms. You have to have printed things. So um, there's some specific, really cool, very shiny, high-tech toys, but you have to have an analog version of everything, and it has to be accessible to everybody. Um, yeah, I know we're about 30 seconds away, so I just want to say those, those, those mapping tools are really useful because wildfire does not respect borders, so you have to kind of contain them in a way that makes sense for you. And, you know, Google surveys are great, but also just knocking on doors is really important too. So, both. I just want to thank each of our panelists for being here, um, able to share some of this uh, great information.